Hi, good evening everyone and welcome to another webinar series um, that we've been doing over the past few months about dementia and obviously the stages of aging. Today we're going to talk about something that is really important which is living well with dementia and I think when we thought about this topic a story came to my mind. Recently someone confided in me as a doctor and said their father's just been diagnosed with dementia and they're not really sure what to do. But I think what really struck me was the fact that he said, now I'm not going to let him out of the house. I'm going to make sure his friends don't know he's not able to like, understand what's going on because they felt really ashamed. And I think that's really important to think about when we go through what we're going to talk about today because a lot of people don't really realize that doing that is actually counterproductive for the patient and that actually makes them get worse over time. And I think that's why it's really interesting that the Department of Health declared a national strategy about living well with dementia. The first time I read the article, what came to my mind was that it was not just about diagnosis, it was about things with nutrition, what they did if they went outside, how they kept their social interactions going, and things like even what do you do when you're not really sure what to do. And I think that's very important to think about because for a lot of us who have aging relatives, which we all will eventually have, the problem that we have is that we're so scared of that diagnosis. When it happens, or if it happens, what do we do next? And I think it's really exciting today because we've got a really beautiful panel of people that are really experienced that will be speaking to us today about living well with dementia. First of all is Dr. Emer. I don't know how to introduce her because the first time I heard about her, I was like, wow, she's actually coming on this. So the thing that's very interesting about her is that I listened to her TED talk on the silent killer in contact sports. It's had millions of people watch it and it was really phenomenal. And I think having you here today is amazing. By the way, she's not just a speaker. She's also a neuroradiologist, a consultant, and she's a leading person in the UK. And she does a lot of work, not just in the UK, but also in the US. I think the last one time I wanted her to come, she was away. And also she's worked in really renowned centers across the world and did a fellowship or part of her training in Harvard University, which is really exciting. And then she heads Recognition Health. Recognition Health does a lot of research on dementia care. And they're trying to bring in measures that ensures that patients actually live well with dementia. Thanks, Dr. Ema. Thanks okay. for being here today. Thank you so much. And I'm sure everyone's wondering, where are we again? And if you look, it says, love, day, care, beyond compare. I think everyone that walks into this place always says, wow, where are we? And we're actually at Love Day, and Love Day, actually, we're the one in Abbey Wood. They've got other centres in Kensington, they've got one in Chelsea Court, and there's one coming up in Notting Hill. But for this to all work, right, where they look after all the people, make sure they live well with dementia, or even just ageing normally, we've got an amazing manager here who is called Isabel. She's actually an experienced care professional who has actually excelled in her business for over 18 years. Isabel's done so many things. She's won awards about social care. Isabel has also worked in many really renowned centers apart from Love Day. And I think the beautiful thing about Isabel is how she always smiles every time you see her and her welcoming smile is just... I remember the first time I met you when I walked in here. I was like, wow, if I had you smile at me every morning, I'll feel a lot better, right? Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you're going to be able to share why Love Day exists to make sure people live better. Thank you for joining us. And I think the, another person that's joined us today is Dr. Oge. And it's really important that Dr. Oge is here for different reasons. When people initially have memory problems or people start noticing that their family or loved ones are struggling, we always say, I'm going to ring my GP. And everyone goes like, the GPs are always very busy. But no one realizes how difficult it is to be a GP and what you have to be able to navigate to ensure that you're not just supporting the patient, but also their relative. And Oge is a renowned GP of over 11 years experience. She's done a lot of work, not just within um, medicine. She also does a lot of work with ethnic minority groups and trying to get doctors to be more socially aware. And more importantly, Oge has done a lot of work also on vaccination, which is really important. And that's things we need to think about, about ensuring that our elderly relatives or family or friends actually are kept up to date with their medications, their vaccinations. And she does a lot of stuff about looking at their medicine to make sure it's not impacting on their quality of life. So thanks, Oge, for joining today. Thanks for being here. So I think we're going to kick off with Living Well with Dementia with the first question, which is, what do you understand, Dr. Ema, by living well? I've said what I think it is. I don't know whether that's completely right, but what do you think is, for you, does living well mean? So I think it probably means slightly different things to different people. But I think generally... 
it's um, a combination of maintaining your general health as best as you possibly can. And you mentioned earlier, it's not just medications. It is actually, there's now a lot of evidence that um, good diet, exercise, remaining very sociable, um, maintaining a very positive attitude, these things actually do have a significant effect. And in fact, it is known now that about 35% of the risk factors for, let's say, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, are actually modifiable. So that means that you can actually modify both your risk and your outcome um, by attending to the key things, exercise, sociability, keeping your brain active, um, and, and sleep and diet. Um, secondly from that, I think it is really important to seek out um, what are the best, um, let's say, medical interventions that are available as well. And, and that is something that I spend a lot of time doing because we work with Big Pharma to um, give people access to new generation medications that are designed to actually slow um, progression of disease and symptoms. Um, and that's, that's a big, big part of maintaining hope um, and also maintaining fitness and wellness. Thank you so much. And I think that gets me to Dr. Ogi. Like Dr. Ema talked about the fact that there's new stuff going on with dementia care. What is it for you that you meet them like before they get a diagnosis? What do you think is really important when we come to try and get early diagnosis? What should we be looking at in community care? in order to make sure that they get there on time so they're able to like benefit from the work that Dr. Ema is doing mm -hmm. and be able to actually pro slow down the progression so they can live a little bit better. Yeah, so from a GP's perspective, we have to look at things in a holistic. People don't fit into silos. They're not just dementia. They may have other conditions going on. So it's really important to really think about optimizing their blood pressure under control, cholesterol. They may have heart problems and other diagnoses. But in terms of what usually happens in terms of leading to a diagnosis, sometimes it can be delayed because the patient themselves says there's nothing wrong. So there is some work that needs to be done to get what we call collateral history from relatives or carers or people that might be around that person. And it may take a while to get the patient to agree to actually come in to see a GP. And we always say, try to book, if you can, a double appointment, explain to the ladies what the concerns are about, always come with the person because what commonly happens is that someone will call saying I'm really worried about my relative I think they're having memory problems they book the appointment because we have to talk to the adults we won't have consent necessarily to discuss with a relative or carer unless there's explicit consent in the notes but the individual may say that they, they all want to come in themselves and it's like, what? so what's happening? And they were like, I'm completely fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong. And what's all the fuss about? So we always say, come with the person if possible. And then we we'll always have a conversation with the patient as well as the carer that's concerned and try to explore, actually, how is it affecting everyone? We talk about personalized care and everyone has a different um, way it may impact them. So actually, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What things are you finding more difficult? And you talk around it that way. But the way to get the diagnosis, there are some basic assessments we can do at the general practice stage, but really you need referral to a specialist, the memory clinic, where they do much more comprehensive assessments. Usually involves a scan of the head to rule out other causes and um, blood tests as well to rule out other things that may be causing memory disturbances. But when the diagnosis is then reached, then I work main in NHS care um, fully. So then there are medications, but there's some types of dementia, there is no medication at the moment. So it is about being in the center, getting the information, but that holistic approach is really crucial. I think that's what's really important is the fact that everyone has to come together to make it work, isn't it, at the end of the day. And I think that brings me to you, Isabel, because I know, obviously, I talked about the fact that I love these really, like, home away from home, right? But I know you guys have a lot of, like, specialised programmes that have been put in place to try and make sure that when patients are eventually diagnosed by the GP, they've got some help from Dr. Eam and that they're actually able to live well if they were away from their home. Will you be able to share some of that with us? Yes, of course. So... Um, we collaborate with research partners to ensure we implement the best approaches in dementia care. Uh, through our collaboration with the University of West London, we developed a dementia, dementia, acti dementia therapies program, which provides um, evidence-based activities which help to alleviate symptoms of dementia. Because we've got industry-leading team ratio and um, very generous number of staff on duty, 
we are able to do amazing things, things which are um, extraordinary, <laughs> uh, things which are exceptional, and we are trying to push boundaries and encourage our members to live the best possible life and live well with dementia. Um, I think, for me, you mentioned my smile, it's really important that we um, promote people's sense of identity, uh, understand what drives them, understand what makes them happy, what is therapeutic for them, this will be different for different people. We have um, things like art therapy, where people can express through art, and um, you can see examples uh, on the wall, exactly. and it's everywhere at Love Day Abbey Road and Kensington and Chelsea Court Place. Uh, we did many exhibitions, there are things, there are paintings I cannot make as well as my residents can. Mm -hmm. That's really amazing. Yeah. We have uh, cognitive stimulation therapies, we have um, culinary masterclasses, where our chefs help our members to uh, prepare lovely snacks they, from the past, or something, dishes or snacks they liked, something they enjoy. Um, we can do things like taking our members swimming, taking them to yoga. I have a resident here who goes to gym twice a week and I really don't see the reason why not. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really important to preserve people's routines which were important to them. I think that's really important. I think that's one thing a lot of people struggle with is like, how am I able to get them to do what they love to do without why protecting them? Because they're not trying to keep them away from people because they don't love them. Because they think it's like a protective mechanism, but instead it's actually not helping the patient in any way or form. And I think that's really important what you shared with us because I think a lot of people just struggle. Like, I don't want my dad to be outside here. I don't want my mom to be seen with these people because people are going to notice there's something not right. But it's nothing to be embarrassed about, right? It's part of the stages of aging, to be honest, right? And I think Dr. Ema was going to say something. What was it like your day? Because I know you do a lot of stuff with like imaging, right? And you're like a top lady boss with when it comes to research and dementia. What was it like walking in your shoes every day? <laughs> well, obviously, like each day is somewhat different. But I just, one, one of the things that I do spend quite a lot of time doing, because I think it's incredibly important, it actually follows on from, from what you were saying, is is actually just educating the public because um, in the end of the day it's so important and particularly with new medications which are designed to slow down the progression of disease um, it's really important to get a diagnosis as early as possible and one of the things that hinders this is people having a few sort of like beliefs that are just not true one is that um, people tend to believe that losing your memory and particularly your short-term memory and other aspects of cognition as we all grow older is normal it's not normal it's common mm -hmm. but it's not normal it's just like cataracts are common but they're not normal um, so that's a that's a really big sort of problem with people presenting early the the other thing is that um it's a pandemic. So the most common cause of dementia, and dementia is it's not a disease, it's obviously just a, a, a sort of like a status that due to any number of different conditions, of which the most common is Alzheimer's, once it reaches a certain stage of progression and the individual starts to lose independence in activities of daily living, then it's, then it's termed as dementia, but it's just an umbrella term. But... Um, I think people not recognising, and it's particularly the person you mentioned there, not recognising this as a pandemic. It's incredibly common, um, particularly you know in the early stages, um, is is also a barrier to people to people recognising there's a problem. Um, so as I said, I spend a lot of time just educating people about this condition. Um, obviously, I spend a lot of time um, looking after people who are coming into clinical trials to get early access to new disease-modifying medications. And a key part of that is that, obviously, if you're giving a medication which is very specific to treat the underlying cause of, say, Alzheimer's disease, then you have to be able to make a very accurate diagnosis. So the diagnoses that we make are specific to, is the cause of your cognitive decline is it due to alzheimer's is it due to vascular disease is it due to something called lewy body disease is it due to parkinson's disease all these different conditions and yes in order to do that there are now really sort of very sophisticated biomarkers um, that will identify the different pathologies that are causing these conditions and whilst it's critical to 
exclude all the sort of like common general things like thyroid and hemoglobin and all these things. Um, it's also having done that and remove and re and sort of like identified any reversible causes because you want to reverse those as quickly as possible. Yeah, and that's the other reason for presenting as early as possible. Then you also want to know exactly what the pathology is in the brain mm -hmm. that is causing the symptoms and specifically treat that. So I don't know if that tells you what I do every day. But that makes sense. That makes sense to me because it tells me a bit, of the, a bit of what you do. So you're educating yeah. patients, you're trying to find out what's really going on and you're actually doing other stuff, right? That, that makes sense. And I was thinking, um, Dr. Oge, is there so, what challenges do you guys face in practice, in general practice when it comes to early diagnosis that people don't sometimes appreciate so i think as people like realizing this is an issue and admitting it and wanting the help and what and agreeing to come in and get assessed um initially we'll do a set of blood tests to make sure the thyroid is normal they're not anemic their kidneys their sugar control and there's no infection so you want to rule out other potential causes of impairment in memory but i think the key thing is one people talk about access so especially in the nhs access to the right clinician at the right time you need a prolonged appointment this is not a 10 minute job so you need I would say 20 to 30 minutes with someone to give some collateral history to really try to tease out what the issue is and um, get that sense of what's important to that person and then explore and educate on the reasons why it's important to get further assessments done. Um, because there are things that can be done and it doesn't mean I think people there's still a lot of stigma around the diagnosis and people don't realize that you can keep on living really full lives and get on treatment that can really slow things down and keep on living full, you know, brilliant lives despite the in spite of the diagnosis. So I think there is a lot to do around getting people um, equipped with the fact that getting an assessment and getting a, a label is not the end of things as such. And I think there's a lot of concern over what that term means if you are classified. And there's still a lot of, no, I don't believe it. You know, there's a lot of patients that come, they've been given medication, they don't really understand what it's for, they don't want to take it. And there's, it, it can lead to a spiral down. So you need to do that follow up. And that's where, for me, general practice, the gift of it is you get to know patients over time. So you can really build on those relationships and then help encourage people that this is the reasoning behind it. They've said this, but it can mean this and it doesn't mean you have to stop doing what you love doing. And I think that's where the, the biggest challenge to that in general practice at the moment is time. But um, we've developed a service where we have a one-stop afternoon where we get carers in, patients in, um, care coordinators, we have social prescribers, third sector organisations like Age UK, you know, um, local groups who provide activities and say, listen, these are all the things that are possible. And that's really gone a long way to helping people realise there's a lot more you can do despite the diagnosis. I think that's really important. Like describing this as a, as a pandemic is really interesting because, you know, we all make noise about when COVID-19 happened, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But nobody realizes how rampant this it is. is this yeah. Is and I think it's, it's really important for the world to know it's a pandemic yeah. and it's also not a disease. I think that's what the problem is because yeah. everyone thinks your life just stops. You know, that person doesn't deserve to live anymore. People lock, lock people up, don't get them, let them come out and stuff. And then they just go downhill. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it was labeled by... WHO is a pandemic in 2018. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like like London buses, you wait, you know, you wait for them to come along, and then two come along at once. And so <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? I know you talked about biomarkers, but I know you do a lot of work with like your neuroradiologists. Yeah, are there things that people should be looking out for in scans, not just um, like doctors should be looking out for forever, like in scans to see yeah. early detection of. Yeah, I mean, well, actually, you made a really good point that um, particularly in the early phases of, of cognitive impairment, the main reason for doing, um, I mean, I think most people do MRI scans now, but even if you're doing a CT or an MRI scan, you're really doing it to exclude something else, if you like. You're, you're doing it to make sure they haven't got an infection, bleed, brain tumour, a bleed, whatever, um, because obviously there are things that need to be treated immediately. Um, in terms of the an MRI scan, which is probably what one would think of as the main type of brain scan, then yes, as again the most common cause being Alzheimer's, as Alzheimer's progresses, um, you do see loss of well, you don't see loss of brain cells, but you see loss of brain volume, and there is a sort of fairly 
typical pattern that this takes and it because it affects short-term memory first then it affects other parts of the brain those areas that are involved in short-term memory language etc they tend to be involved first on the scan so you start, you see a sort of like fairly classic pattern of atrophy um, but that's really sort of pretty much all you see in terms of Alzheimer's the the other thing is obviously if somebody has vascular disease, then vascular disease is something, it's something called small vessel disease, and there's a characteristic appearance of that on an MRI scan. But there are lots of other conditions like Lewy body disease, Parkinson's disease, that you won't you won't really see anything. But there are other types of scans that you would do for that. So there's something called a DAT scan, which is something you do to diagnose Parkinson's disease. Um, and then there's sort of PET scans, um, and the two key types of PET scans really, there's something called an FTG PET scan, it measures um, metabolic activity in the brain, so if there are parts of the brain that just aren't working properly because the brain cells aren't working properly, then you'll see areas of sort of like hypo, so low metabolism in those, and they're characteristic patterns again for other conditions like something called frontotemporal dementia has a particular pattern. Um, and then sort of like, if you like, moving on, <laughs> um, then, and mainly used now, to be honest, in sort of like, you know, research clinical trials and that, but available clinically, and particularly for, you know, like younger people where you really have to get the accurate diagnosis, um, you can do something called a PET amyloid scan. And that's a sort of quite sophisticated scan that will confirm or refute the presence of abnormally elevated levels of toxic amyloid protein in the brain, which is the sort of like hallmark for Alzheimer's. Um, and then sort of like coming soon, there's obviously lots and lots of lots of stuff <laughs> coming soon. And they're biomarkers, they're sort of like different proteins and things, amyloid tau proteins you can measure in the spinal fluid. So you can do a lumbar puncture and measure in the spinal fluid to make an accurate diagnosis. Um, and, and now there's lots and lots of work on doing blood tests that will be able to measure amyloid proteins and tau proteins and various other different factors that tell us about brain injury you know, like acquired or, you know, like either traumatic or due to these types of diseases. Um, so there's, there's a massive amount of research and development going on currently to make it possible for everyone really to be, have easy access to a ubiquitous um, biomarker type test that can be done every day in general practice or probably almost like done at home or whatever. Um, so yes, it's, it's, it's something that there's, there's the, the rate of change in terms of understanding and developing tests for this is phenomenal. I think it's quite great like because a lot of people think like there's not a lot going on oh my and when god, you talk about so it it's like oh my on. god there's so yeah. much going on there's right? so much going on which is on. like a ray of hope for people right yeah because um, hopefully yeah. in the future we don't know yet yeah. but. I mean there's been a you know the brain the well the brain and mind but let's at least just say the brain is sort of like the last bastion really of sort of like <laughs> sort of research and understanding so um, yes, you know, whereas there's been massive research into antibiotics and into cancer and, you know, all these different things, the sort of brain, the brain has been the, you know, like a tough nut, nut to crack, if you like, but now the, the rate of development of brain research is, is, is exponential. And I think that brings me to Isabel, right? <laughs> because we talked about challenges people are facing. I know um, Love Day is always trying to make sure pa patients live like their normal lives, but are there some challenges that you face sometimes being able to meet people's needs as individuals? Because I know you have really, I remember like, I think over the summer you guys had like a fashion show that's really good. I'm just wondering like, what are the challenges you're facing day to day? I think the the, the most um, I, would, I, would, I think the most difficult challenge I am facing and I have faced across my career is um, to understanding the family and what they are worried about because sometimes the families and relatives or loved ones have different views of how we should respond to our resident. And you obviously mentioned the stigma and people are worried about somebody having dementia, they don't want to say it or they want uh, parents or loved ones to do things which they, they literally want to hide them sometimes. I think the most important is communication uh, and in a way education as well, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has to be done in a very sensitive and tactful way because there are sometimes responses are here which are not so great. And I think, I feel that wives and husbands um, looking after someone at home for a long time experience like carer fatigue because they are not meant to be a carers. They, they, are married, they are people who are meant to be husband and wife. 
I've seen it a lot, but I always find a way to connect, um, to understand what what is important for my what my patient is worried about and what the relative is worried about, and find a happy meeting and support both. I think that's interesting, isn't it? About mm. nobody understands how much the carer gets stressed also and literally that impacts on them a lot and i think that's difficult isn't it i don't know like we okay do you get a lot of like carers coming to you like anxiety with depression like is that what do you do in that situation so one of the beauties and challenges of general practice you're looking after the whole family so you're looking after the patient with dementia and usually their relative whether it's a spouse or a daughter or a niece or someone else that's looking after them so we spend just as much time, if not more, actually consulting with the carer. And you're absolutely right. Sometimes the interest or the, what the patient says they're wanting can be disregarded in that conversation because the carer, from a place of well intention, of course, and a place of love and care, can sometimes want to protect and hide and not want the person to do what they maybe would normally do. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. I love what you said about the care of fatigue. They're supposed to be there as the spouse, as the relative, that quality time, yet spend a lot of their time caring. And care of fatigue is real. So one of the things we should be doing is doing annual carer health checks as part of the dementia reviews, mm -hmm. signposting carers to other you know, sources of support making sure, and one of that is encouraging the patient to engage in activities, to give that carer a break. But it's that balance. I love what you said about generous, um, what did you say, the generous workforce, you know, your, your, which is a, you know, a luxury that's not always there because that can be the challenge. And having enough other people that can step in and fill in some of those gaps can be a big part of that. But yes, looking after the carer is almost as important at times and it's a big part of what we do. I would, if I may say, I, I would add to that that I think one of the things that's really difficult with um, progressive loss of cognition and yes. slight dementia is that, one, the, the individual is changing, yes. um, but yeah. secondly, the, if it's a couple or whatever, the, the partner is, is no longer able to face what is a, you know, like a, a, a serious situation with their partner, they, they suddenly are having to take over all the responsibility. So, you know, the financial responsibility, the responsibility of managing the, you know, the house, the daily activities and managing the individual. Without that individual being able to help in sharing what is the sort of like the biggest sort of like challenge that they're facing. So the carer can often be not just physically exhausted, but actually really sort of like quite lonely um, because they're their companion that they normally share their challenges with is not able to share those challenges. Because life is going on while they're trying to care for their loved ones. It's just difficult, yeah. isn't it? So I think that's the whole idea about living well with dementia is all about everyone, right? It's all about holistic care, making sure the patient and themselves are being supported, their family, their carers, everyone really yeah. has to be looked after to be able to make sure that they're supporting them well. Because if they're not like that fatigued, then they're not lashing out, they're not frustrated, and in that way they're caring better, I think. But one of the lovely things that I've heard recently, one patient's writing his memoirs, you know, whilst he still can, you know, and his partner's supporting him to do that because he wants to do that, so something for his grandchildren. And you've heard the people creating beautiful pieces of music and still doing that. So it's about that intentionality. Getting something like this doesn't mean it's the end, but being more intentional about doing some of those things you wanted to do and maybe have been putting off. Travelling, you know, there's so many things that patients have done that all of a sudden there's more impetus to do it whilst they still can, you know? I think it's really interesting, like, the work that everyone's doing just to make sure people actually live well. And I think that brings me to you, Dr. Eme. I know you're doing a lot of research. I'm not sure whether you can share all of it with us, but there's a lot of drug research that you're also doing. And I think it would be nice to know, is anything groundbreaking happening soon or that has happened already or, you know, yeah. that's going to bring a ray of hope to everyone? Yeah, no, certainly. And... Um I think it's entirely appropriate for us all to be, you know, really sort of like cautiously optimistic now. And um, just in the last year, there have been two sort of like medications that have been presented at big international conferences. They're, they're ones that we've been working with, with, with our patients. And um, both of them have been demonstrated to successfully remove this thing called toxic levels of amyloid protein from the brain, which is the sort of like hallmark of this disease. Um, and also to slow down further progression of disease and symptoms. Um, so, you know, whilst it's early days, um, I think one of the sort of like expressions that 
everybody is using is that this is definitely the end of the beginning. So that, you know, we really now are in a new phase where it is possible to treat Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's always been possible to sort of treat vascular disease and, and things with control of blood pressure and everything. But, you know, the big, if you like, the, the big scary one, <laughs> which is Alzheimer's, that there, there are no drugs. And, um, I mean, you mentioned earlier, we have clinics in the US as well. And we are now able to prescribe medications. And there's two that are on the market at the moment um, in the US. So it's, it, it's a really, really exciting time. Um, the regulatory bodies for <clears throat> for drugs um, are looking at um, the first of these two medications in the UK at the minute, uh, and obviously, like I have absolutely no idea. Um, but you know, I when or how or which medication will eventually become available in the UK. But um, certainly, there will be medications for this. I think that's really yeah, good. and I, and I think the the other thing, which is you know, it's like every this is no different. Else, no different from any other disease. And um, the thing that it, about it that you know is really quite interesting is that these biomarkers are present for usually about 20 years before the first symptom even develops. So you know, once it's possible to have the ability to identify the presence of disease before symptoms develop, a bit like diabetes, and it's also possible to provide a treatment which, when given really early, can not only slow down further progression of disease, but can push out the time at which the disease might otherwise start to become obvious, then you're in the realm of prevention. And, and we actually, we're starting a trial in the new year, which is for exactly that. It's identifying people who have evidence of biomarkers, but don't have any symptoms, um, but who have the opportunity to come into a study for whatever reason they'd like to do that. And the purpose of that is to prevent them from ever developing yeah, the disease. And we have lots of different, you know, lots of different types of medications that are in this stage now. So, you know, vaccines, which are actually sort of like giving people the potential to create their own antibodies to these toxic proteins, um, giving people antibodies against the proteins to remove them from the body and bring the levels back into the normal range. Um, you know, all, all sorts of different mechanisms. Um, so it's, it's, as I said, it's an incredibly active arena. Um, it's available right now for people in clinical trials, but it, you know, it just will, like any other, it's no different from any other disease. There just will be a treatment and ultimately there will be the ability to actually prevent onset of symptoms. So yeah, I'm hoping time for me. So I'm very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. So I think you've joined us from home. We're talking about living well with dementia. And we've been speaking to Dr. Emer, Isabel, and Dr. Oge. And as usual, we always want to know what your questions are, because this is like your opportunity to actually ask the questions that actually bother you. So if you can type your questions, we should be able to share that with Dr. Emer or Oge or Dr. Oge or Isabel so that we're able to like get those questions in. So I'm gonna to go to you, Oge, because I know that obviously general practice is always where it all starts, right? We've talked about, Dr. Emus talks a bit about pharmacological was available. Is there any strategies that are put in place in general practice that is not medical-based or medicine-based, more importantly, to try and like help patients live better? I know you talked about the fact that you've got the, um, um, the group that you do once in a while. Is there, are there other things that people can access in the UK? And I guess for people that are logging in from other countries, maybe they can start those groups in their own countries also. So I think that peer support and support for both the carer and the patient is crucial. So charities like Dementia UK do some phenomenal work, you know, along that line. There's also training for reception staff, you know, they become dementia champions. So just to recognise patients who are diagnosed with it and how to adjust and make adjustments to make sure that care is provided in a more holistic and timely manner. More time adjustments as well as just an understanding if you're not um, get to, you know, just a, a, a realisation that these patients may need a little bit of extra care and adjustments made. So I think in terms of the, that's at the general practice level, but in the local community, charities like Age UK, organisations like that have done some great work in providing activity clubs that are accessible to all. Then it's about getting them there, transport and all those other logistics. But I think COVID was really difficult and it showed when these clubs all shut down mm -hmm. and that, that isolation and loneliness in itself is just as bad in so many ways as the disease and it really caused a lot of harm. 
So now that they've, they've restarted back up, sometimes some patients encourage them, it's taken time to encourage them to go back out because there's been a lot of fear. But we're now in a position where we do have protection with vaccinations. Care homes are our number one priority. Lots of GP practices up and down the country are out there right now vaccinating with flu and COVID because you want to keep them physically well so that they can interact and go out for their clubs and their activities because that's so crucial. I think talking about the pandemic, when we talk about COVID pandemic, not the dementia pandemic, it's like, oh my God, we can't afford this anymore. Because obviously the news is saying there's a new pandemic coming again and it's scary for people. I think the isolation is done, obviously, done. it was supposed to be protective, I must say, but then it's done more harm than good for a lot of patients. And I think what you're talking about, trying to make sure people are like vaccinated, people are like having support group is so important, right? And I think... Going on about non-pharmacological things that we do, that comes to you, Isabel. I know that you talked about paintings and Love Day and different things, but I think the one thing that I notice whenever I walk into Love Day is how beautiful the whole place looks, right? And there must be a reason why this is done. I don't know whether it's like a stimulated, to stimulate people or to make sure people feel like they're home away from home, but is there anything about how the design actually of a place where anyone goes to like Love Day will affect their well-being in general. I'm just wondering, just out of curiosity, because I remember stepping into the first one I went to was the one at Kensington, and I was like, okay, there's not like a normal nursing home. What's going on here? Is there a reason why this was done? And I think it's nice. Sorry, I'm not going to share your secret. Hopefully the competitors are not listening. <laughs> but like, I just want to know, because I think it's really important for people to understand. So, obviously design is not... Uh, we work very closely with University of Stirling, so this is, the, I would say, the key. Uh, we pay attention to design and how our homes are designed, and they're supposed to be um, easy to live in for residents living with dementia. So there are various things which support our members, like we've got tonal contrast, tonal, tonal, sorry, tonal co colors, so they guide our residents um, and guide them, for example, where the floor ends and when the wall starts. Mm -hmm. We've got lighting, which is um, reflecting natural body clock. So there will be different light at 6 o'clock in the morning, there will be different at lunchtime, there will be different at 6 o'clock. Uh, and it will support changes in behavior, it will alleviate symptoms of sundowning. Um, I don't know if you saw our garden, uh, which is obviously okay. sensory. <laughs> Uh, it's got herbs, it's got lovely flowers, where residents can go, cut them, and do flower arranging. Um, the garden doesn't have dead ends, so it's very easy to navigate. Uh, we've got raised flower beds, which um, obviously support our residents to do gardening. Um, we have signposted bathrooms, toilet seats. Um, they are important details, you know, in, in everyday living. So there are lots of things uh, well thought of in every property. I think, do you think that with things like that, do people in their homes, are they able to like implement these things to help their loved ones also? What do you think? Uh, I don't think to the extent we can. Okay. I really makes don't sense. think. Yeah, makes sense. Actually, makes a lot of sense. Because I think the important thing is just being able to get things looking natural for people and that way they don't feel like anything's changed right i think that's what we've been talking about tonight about just making sure that people are able to stay either in their environments or come to you because i know apart from people living in here they also have the day clubs isn't it where people can come to so even if they cannot leave here because they want to be in their own homes they can come for like day club i'm just wondering how does a day club work well day club is amazing because people can come and they can go and they know it's a place to come to meet nice friends or to have nice meals, to, to have amazing activities. And for me, it's, day club is really crucial in assisting people in the transition from their own homes to a care home, mm -hmm. because they can come as often as they want. Um, then we would um, encourage them also to have respite space at certain point. And what was really lovely, which I shared with um, somebody this evening, is that in the last two weeks I have three uh, day club members who actually moved in permanently to Love Day mm -hmm. Abbey Road. And what's lovely, they know each other, they know the staff, they know what we do, they know our entertainers. Mm -hmm. And it just, they actually feel at home. They're not asking to go home, and I think this is really good. Um, it's, it's much more difficult for someone to come to a care home 
and be admitted on a permanent basis, although I know sometimes it's necessary because there are safety concerns. But day club is definitely the key. Okay. So, Seema, I was going to ask a question because I think a lot of people are going to wonder that like, are logging in from different places that have loved ones. Like, if they needed to access, do they, how do you choose people that are going to the trial? How do people access some of these drugs that are not available in the UK? I know that some of them are available in the US. I'm just wondering, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, so, the, the, so the drugs that are on the market in the or worldwide are what we call symptomatic drugs. So they've been on the market for 20 years or so, and they can be accessed via the memory centers, their GPs, etc. cetera. And, the, and in a very sort of like high level way, the best way to explain that is that those drugs just help the dying brain cells that are under attack from the disease to function a bit more efficiently. So it's sort of like a little bit like drinking coffee when you're tired. It, it's just sort of like razzing the brain cells up a bit. The, the new medications are designed to stop those brain cells from dying in the first place. And um, those medications are all in clinical trial. So they're not on the market yet in the UK. And, and it's really easy to access a clinical trial. All you need to do is to sort of like just go online. Obviously, if you Google recognition health, <laughs> you'll, you'll find them. And, and we have six centres in the UK, in, in, like in Birmingham, London, Guildford, Bristol. Plymouth um, and you you just I mean you can for us you can just apply online you can you can just pop in your name and just you know a contact detail and then we have a team of, sort of like experts that will then call you and they'll run through a number of different questions to see which study you're most likely to be eligible for but like sometimes we do have studies for people who are more advanced they have got more severe symptoms on the whole, they tend to be for people who have milder symptoms, again, simply because if you're giving something to slow something down, you need to give it as early as possible. So a bit like the escalator sort of analogy, we're trying to keep people up at the top of the escalator. Um, but but th there's, a, there's a real sort of like broad, broad cross-section of studies, even to the extent we have one, as I said, in the new year, which will be for people completely cognitively normal to prevent them from from getting the mention. I think that's I think that's something I think is really going to be groundbreaking because well, for a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people are just scared. Like I forgot yeah. something. Oh my god, what's yeah. happened today? Right? You know, you're really like uh, really mean, worried about it. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, we usually well when we've done these studies before for the normal, as much as any of us are um, people. Um, actually, what we tend to find is, yes, there are lots of people who are sort of like, you know, in the category of being completely cognitively normal. But actually, we find a huge number of the people that I think you're, you're sort of seeing or not seeing who are sort of thinking, oh, I don't really think there's anything wrong, you know, etc. Um, and often a lot of people um, contact us about those normal studies and then we're able to say, actually, this isn't quite the one for you, but, but in fact, we have one here, which is absolutely perfect. Can I add one thing that you were saying earlier, because I, I, I just think it's sort of like so important, is that I know it's obvious, but sort of like not all parts of the brain obviously do all the same things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is really important when people do have these mild and even more advanced symptoms is that there can be parts of the brain that are actually relatively sort of like like unaffected. And for example, the, the, um, the appreciation um, and memory for music and songs and everything is completely different from the appreciation and memory of, you know, I don't know, maybe um, what we call visuospatial, finding your way around. Um, so it, 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 one of the reasons I think, you know, like Love Day is so great and everything is because they really have studied um, sort of what the brain is finding difficult and what the brain is responding to. And, and it's almost like you, you can actually tap so much more um, resource out of, the, out of that brain, and it's different for individuals, but there are certain patterns that, that these conditions follow. And it is important to understand, understand that, and that's also very much what's important in these workshops and everything. So, thanks for sharing that, actually, that's really good. <laughs> That's really that, that makes sense about the work that it's I'm, I really like the fact that you talked about the work that's being put in place to actually get lovely way it is today and I think that's very important because for a lot of people it's not just a beautiful place it's yes. not just a beautiful place it's all about getting you living really well while you're struggling with this pandemic really I think that's very important because I think we all see it as oh it's so nice but I know because a lot of my patients have come here have had the best experience and recently one of the patients that came here post-op said to me oh no this has to be 
why can't you bring this back home to other countries? I really miss Love Day. And it's really interesting when they say that because even the recovery for the post-op patients, because I know you do all the stuff apart from dementia care, obviously. It's amazing the amount of work that gets in, that, puts it, that you put in place to make sure pe people just get better and they can leave the place. That's really important. Well done, obviously, for the work you do. And I know recently you got nominated for something. You're not sharing. Are you going to share with us what's going on? We Love Day and the good news. We were nominated, well, obviously Love Day Every Road was nominated for Color Innovation Awards and I'm not surprised with that, to be honest, because I think there was lots of work put in and uh, even our neighbours sometimes stopped me and asked me about the building, <laughs> which is really great. But um, I think um, I can share with you that, you know, Love Day Kensington was rated outstanding by Calculated Commission on the first inspection in four categories. They achieved outstanding. And I think it's That's a massive amazing. achievement. That's and very and yes. Yeah, yes. we're very proud of our Kensington yeah. colleagues. Uh, we will try to repeat it. I think it's so it's funny because Abby was just opened a few months ago and you're already getting nominated for like awards because of the work you do. Well done. Like I cannot stress it enough that it's and I think doing this program is also super amazing. Like trying to get people to understand what it is like because a lot of people are struggling. People come to us every day saying, what do we do? How do we get the help that we need? And I think that's very important. And I think that brings me to you, Dr. Ogay, about I know you do a lot of work with like GPs and different people. There are also GPs that have logged in today maybe or will access this video at some point who don't have the what we have in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. Are there things like online or like um, telemedicine options that they could have to help them support their patients wherever they're living in the world? So yeah, e-learning has always been really helpful. I think there was a big emergence of it with webinars and um different things that you can log on to and do. So Royal College of GPs will put on things, Royal College of Physicians as well. So there's lots of information out there for people who are interested. And I think it is about keeping that up to date because things are changing so rapidly. And I think dementia is always seen as one of those things, oh, people feel there's not much you can do, but actually there is so much you can do, not just with the novel medications that are coming that are so exciting to hear about. But, and prevention, for me as a GP, prevention is better than cure, and that is the hallmark. So really excited to hear about that. But even that holistic approach and really addressing the needs of the carers and really looking out for what resources are there in your local communities as well. There'll be groups that are doing things from the ground up, charities that will be doing work. And I think there needs to be a lot more connection from you know medics with their communities and what people are already doing to help groups of people in these situations. So um, people should look out as such beyond their organizations to see what's possible. Thanks. I think uh, there's a question I was going to ask you, Dr. Ema, that I completely forgot about. Um, are there like things, like, what obstacles are popular? I know you talked about other obstacles that we um, go through when we're trying to do research. And you were talking about the fact that the people in the UK can only access what's going on in recognition health through clinical trials. Are there like ethical considerations that people like that want to get into trials should like you put in place to assure people that they're coming into this trial and it's possible that they're going to benefit from it? And I don't know, people always have that question because every time you say to someone who's coming to a clinical trial, they're all scared about, oh my God, what's going to happen to the data? What are they going to do with the stuff they're going to do? Are they really doing what they're saying? Are they giving me, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I think for people that reassures people in, at home to know that yeah. they should really be part of this trial. Yeah, I, I, I think again, I think there's sort of like, generally quite a few myths about clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that's been really great actually is, is everything that happened with COVID. I mean, I think people recognise that we wouldn't have COVID vaccines if we hadn't done clinical trials. So I, I think people realise it's a really major part of medicine. And, and actually, to, to give you an example, um, like children who have cancer, like 90% of them will be in clinical trials and will be in a clinical trial unless there's one not available. And that's because they just have to get the, the latest, best medications. If you flip that for, for people with dementia, it's like about 4%. So, so and, and the other thing is that it's a highly regulated, I mean, it's the most like highly regulated service or industry after aviation. So um, the safety parameters and the explanation of what's happening and the monitoring um, and actually the it's hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of healthcare. It's access to the very, very latest, you know, world sort of world-class um, diagnostics 
um, and sort of like management. So it, it's a phenomenal sort of opportunity, but highly, highly regulated. And, and the clinical trials, um, the, the sort of like the, the endpoints are always set. And if, if a study's not progressing to the endpoint, then, it, then it's obviously stopped. So you're, you're never really in a study that's not tracking to its endpoints. Um, obviously, you could be on active medication or placebo, but with most of the studies, I mean, certainly the ones we do, at the end of that of that randomized period, then almost always everybody gets the, the full dose of active medication. Um, and I suppose it's sort of like, you know, the proof the pudding is in the eating in so much as that, um, I, d I don't know if you know many people saw Fergus Walsh doing the BBC presentation on Dananamab recently, which was the sort of like the big one that, you know, that, res that reported its results in, um, in July. Um, but I can tell you that um, all of the patients in the UK that are taking Dananamab are our patients. Um, and, you know, like we also have lots of patients on other medications as well. And they didn't know. We've got people on Dananamab who joined it during lockdown and they, they didn't know that that was going to be a drug that would come out with fantastic results. So, so it's sort of like, you know, you never know sort of thing. But I think the thing that I wouldn't i think is is very important to recognize and never underestimate and that is the power of hope yeah. and um you know the one thing that all our all our patients we obviously have patients that are not on clinical trials as well mm -hmm. but all our patients are on clinical trials the one thing that they have is they have the hope that they are going to be the people on the first most successful drug that that comes on the market and, and that's big. Like, I would just never underestimate that. I think that word hope is what we're going to take out from here. I think that you have to be looking forward to something because yeah. it is yeah. like, and obviously the first drug that you talked about has been, it's got a lot of like media, like friends yeah. you already, like I read those articles yeah. and I think, and it's been really interesting reading it and very hopeful for a lot of people. Yeah. So. I, think that's as, I think as one of my patients said, it's better be a trailblazer than be last in the queue. You know, Makes you sense, say, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think talking about hope, right? I, Isabel, I'm going to say something. So if someone wanted to join like Love Day, how does it work? I think that's what people are going to ask. <laughs> to get the, the beautiful place called Love Day with all the years of research to get this place to work. Um, what I normally do, I meet my prospective uh, members in their own homes. And I think it's really important to uh, get to know them, get to know their surroundings, their friends, their family. Um, see what colors they like on the walls so then I can match it because this is what we do. Uh, there is um, massive, enormous effort uh, put in to make sure that the transition is smooth, that when somebody comes in, uh, the room looks perfect and by perfect looks familiar. Uh, there is the same furniture or similar furniture or hopefully the same furniture brought from home. Mm -hmm. um, the same pictures, the same ornaments. We always talk to the families and friends about lifestyle choices. And we talk to our prospective members because they also can express their mm -hmm. choices. But if they can't, then I would um, ask for support uh, from people they know. And it's um, we always contact the doctors for, for, for brief summaries, for yeah. GP reports, because this is also important for us to hand over the medical care to our GP. Uh, our members are welcome to retain the previous GP if possible and if the surgery is not too far and they can come for home visits. But the most important for me is to understand expectations, understand what people are worried about, what makes them happy so I can make sure it happens here and they can continue their lifestyle choices here, they can bring their friends. Um, I want to know at what time they want to have a cup of Earl Grey tea because I know how important it is in my routine. <laughs> <laughs> and little things matter. Yeah, little things matter. I think so. Um, so, you know, I have some very interesting, stunning but interesting bedrooms here, but they were, they were decorated in response to my members' choices. Some are very red, some are pink, some are light green. <laughs> and they look amazing, they look homely, they are comfortable. 
I think I remember one of your nurses assessing a patient once and saying, what TV programs do you want? Because we're going to have to adjust the TV to fit your programs, right? Yes. And it was someone that was like culturally diverse, not someone, not a British person. No, no, no. And they were like, oh, we're going to have to get it. And then they said to me, oh, should we change the carers also to make sure they speak their language? Yeah. We will get someone in to make sure that helps them. And I think that's really, really amazing to do that, right? Because I think that means you're really personalizing the care for that person. And I think that's very impressive. I think, okay, I'm going to ask you one last thing, because I know you work a lot with a lot of, like, culturally diverse communities, right? Do you think that the way cultures perceive dementia, it's different? Or do you think there's a big impact on that? I think that's really important for... It can be, because, again, it is, again, about that personalised care, really trying to find out who that person is, the context, family, their understanding. I think other cultures may have more of, um, you know, you know, multi-generational homes living in the same home. So they can potentially facilitate looking after that. But then living in the Western culture where you have to go out for work and it's a lot more difficult to maybe get help in, you have to adjust accordingly. So that's where I think getting to know your community and what help there is and centres like this, which can be real lifelines and can really help. Culturally wise, I mean, culture is food, it's language, it's music. There's so many aspects of it. And again, that's where that rapport and getting to know that person and personalising the care is so crucial. Thanks so much. And I think we've come towards the end. We've got, I'm going to ask one thing before we do that. There's a question. But before we get to the question, I just wanted each one of you, like Dr. Ema, to just give one word of hope to people about living well with dementia, whatever it is. Not a question. Something people can take out of this and say, I'm going to hold on to these words because I know with that there is hope for me or for my relative. There is definitely hope. Um, the new medications and other non-drug interventions are being developed, recognised and implemented that are ultimately going to have this disease or the causes of these diseases in a situation where, like diabetes or anything else, it's it's not a major it's not a major problem. And as, as well, do you have a word for people? I think I would encourage people to ask for support. I think sometimes people struggle, and I know I keep telling about it, but I've had a few scenarios recently when I when I just witnessed it, and I can see how difficult it is for people to care for their um, loved ones at home. Uh, please ask for support. Uh, support is there. There are doctors. Uh, there's a science research. Society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's research. Um, shout for help. Uh, and I would say, um, people with dementia can live good life. They can continue their lifestyle choices. They can be happy. And um, we can support people to live well. Yeah, just consider it a chronic condition that can be managed like so many other things as such. So sometimes I think that intentionality can be there. You have a diagnosis, but then it's an opportunity to put things in order. So get finances in order, lasting power of attorney, all of those things in place. Know who you want to look after you in the, in the time, like preparing ahead. And I always say that these things are what we should all be doing, but it becomes more kind of urgent if a diagnosis like this comes your way or family members way but then take the opportunity to explore you know that music that creativity those activities that you may think oh, I'll get round to it later and I think that's the it can be managed and that's an important thing to let people know thank you so much and we've got one question because normally we ask people for questions and he says what are the essential coping strategies in dementia anyone can take a question I'd, I'd say one thing I'd say make sure that you have optimized your vision and your hearing. Yes. That is just like so important. If I was to say one thing, I'd say optimize your vision and your hearing. And then that, that's a good one, right? Something, something as earwax, you know, sometimes to take the machine to look and get that earwax. It's true, it's a big, big, so simple, but can make a big difference, absolutely. Honestly, I kind of thank you guys enough. And I think, thank you so much for sharing like, obviously your experience about and the strategies for living well with dementia. And I think for me, my hope for, or my word for hope for people is that I look at hope like an instrument that has feathers, right? And it keeps flying higher up. And one day you're going to be able to get to somewhere that you're dreaming to get to. And I think that's what people should go away thinking. The research you're doing, getting early diagnosis, putting a place like this in place to be able to support people is like, that instrument that flies, right? And helps you get to where you want to get to. And I know it's still early days as we talked about, but I hope that one day 
we will get a cure or something that supports a lot. And I think the truth is that we should never be ashamed to know that this is a pandemic. We shouldn't be ashamed to know that we can keep living well, even though there's a diagnosis of dementia. And I think that's just the great part about tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, again. And for everyone that's logged in from different places, I don't know where they've logged into this. Normally, I would say a greeting in the different places. Thanks for joining, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks, and good night.